Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the webinar, Prosecuting Cases Involving Victims with Developmental Disabilities, a focus on sexual assault. My name is Charlie Whitman Barr, and I'm an Associate Attorney Advisor at Equitas, the prosecutor's resource on violence against women, and I will be moderating today's webinar. Today's presentation will prepare prosecutors to anticipate issues and evidence prior to trial, file and argue pretrial motions, develop trial strategies that take into account the victim's intellectual or developmental disabilities, as well as any mental health issues, will introduce relevant evidence at trial while excluding the irrelevant and consider appropriate sentencing options. Before we begin the substantive portion of our program, I want to provide a brief overview of our iLink webinar service. You can listen to this webinar either via computer or conference call. For best use of iLink, I strongly recommend calling in from a landline to our conference line at 530-881-1212, passcode 202-731-738, and that number is in the upper left-hand portion of your screen. To connect to the internet audio, please click the connect button on your start screen. If you use the audio option, please do not also call into the webinar. Only do so if you can experience difficulty with your internet audio. <clears throat> if you experience any technical issues, you can use the iLink Can Race Indicator, which is located in the toolbar in the top left-hand portion of your screen above our presenter's photo and to the right of the conference call number. You can also contact iLink directly at 1-800-799-4510. Throughout today's presentation, our presenters may pose questions to the audience. You can respond using the feedback indicators to your left below the attendee list and by using the private chat option just below that. We encourage you to post questions and comments throughout today's presentation via private chat to me, Charlie Whitman Barr, and I will share your comments anonymously with our presenters so they can be addressed to it during today's presentation. Today's presentation is hosted by Equitas, the prosecutor's resource on violence against women. Equitas's mission is to improve the quality of justice and sexual violence intimate partner violence, stalking and human trafficking cases by developing, evaluating, and refining prosecution practices that increase victim safety and offender accountability. Equitas provides prosecutors with support, training, mentorship, and resources necessary to objectively evaluate and constantly re-examine and refine their approach to justice. Equitas staff conduct legal research, provide 24-7 case consultation, host specialized and state-specific training events and webinars, and provide individual experts to jurisdictions and organizations, and publish articles, monographs, and other resources on topics relevant to the prosecution of violence against women. We're very excited to be joined today by the ARC's National Center on Criminal Justice and Disability. The ARC promotes and protects the human rights of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And the goal of the National Center on Criminal Justice and Disability is to build the capacity of the criminal justice system and to respond to gaps in existing services for people with disabilities, focusing on people with intellectual and developmental disabilities who remain a hidden population within the criminal justice system with little or no access to advocacy, support, or services. The National Center <laughs> provides training and technical assistance, an online resource library, publications promoting identification and evaluation to support promising practices and public awareness. We would also like to acknowledge the contributions of Beverly France at the, and the Institute on Disabilities at Temple University, which this presentation was originally part, presented as part of a three-part series with the Temple Institute. Please note that today's presentation is being recorded and a handout version of today's PowerPoint will be provided to you following the webinar of, along with the full biographies of our presenters. Today's presenters are Victoria Christensen, Equitas Attorney Advisor, and Catherine Walker, Criminal Justice Fellow with the ARCS National Center on Criminal Justice and Disability. Prior to joining Equitas, Vicki served as a Deputy Attorney General and Special Assistant to the Attorney General of New Jersey. She also served as a Senior Attorney at the National Center for the Prosecution of Violence Against Women and as an Assistant District Attorney in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Ms. Walker completed her JD and Master of Public Health at the University of Miami while completing her JD and PH. Catherine works in the Health Rights Clinic, a medical legal partnership handling veterans' benefits, social security disability, and permanency planning. She also worked on the Institutional Conditions Team at Disability Rights Florida and interned with the Department of Justice, Civil Rights, Disability Rights Section in Washington, D.C. Before joining the ARC in December 2013, Catherine completed her MBH, MPH as a legal policy intern for Judge David L. Bazelon Center for Mental Health Law. I'd now like to turn the presentation over to Vicki and Catherine for um, the substantive portion of today's presentation.
Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Um, a version of webinar, as Charlie earlier stated, was originally developed through a project that we worked on with Bev France for the Institute on Disabilities at Temple University. And along with thanking and acknowledging Bev France, I also want to thank my colleague, as well as the webinar's moderator, Charlie Whitman, as well as Christopher Malio, sexual violence investigative officer at the University of Pennsylvania. Also, I especially want to thank my co-presenter, Catherine Walker, and her colleagues at the ARC. When we worked with Bev, Bev stressed that the number of people living with disabilities worldwide is growing, and that's due partly to population aging, and also because of a global increase in chronic health conditions, such as diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and mental illness, which are associated with disability. So today we'll use the lens of a sexual assault case to focus on the allied criminal justice response to crimes involving victims, mostly adults, but some juvenile-specific information, who have developmental disabilities or mental health issues. We'll identify pretrial strategies, including pretrial motions that prosecutors can utilize to support victims with mental disabilities. We'll also discuss how to use experts during the investigative trial prep and trial stages, how to identify and introduce evidence that can corroborate the crime, and discuss sentencing options and post-conviction considerations. A note about the term victim. The term victim can be complicated and can be construed to mean certain things to certain people. So first, people survive criminal acts and should be viewed as survivors. But in the context of criminal law, and particularly within a courtroom, in order to ensure clarity and to ensure that we remain offender-focused, the term utilized most often is victim. The term victim here is independent of whether or not a person has any kind of disability. For attorneys handling cases where such terminology is going to be used, a suggested practice is to clarify the terminology at the outset. Stress that the term is related to the crime and offender, that the person before you is a survivor, and that the victimization term is not about the fact that the person who has been a crime victim also happens to have a disability. Catherine? Yeah, thank you guys for having me today. This is Catherine with the National Center on Criminal Justice and Disability, and we are thrilled to be participating. So I'm going to start today with just talking a little bit more about our area of expertise, people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. I'm sorry, I'm not sure. Do I have the control to do next slide, or are you guys doing that for me? There we go. All right. Um, so we're going to start with the basics here. Um, so understanding that victims with disabilities really face some unique challenges in the criminal justice system and that you should keep in mind as attorneys that knowing one person with a disability means you know one person with a disability. This word disability encompasses a really wide array of life experiences um, and just uh, a lot of the stereotypes that we hold don't necessarily apply across that wide array. And also keeping in mind that disability is a human rights issue, just like race, gender, and religion. So next we're going to look at a slide with a nice chart on it to kind of help get some, uh, some disability knowledge started. So this is just a way that I kind of help conceptualize disability for myself. And it's not an exclusive list of disabilities by any means, but it's kind of a way to help visualize the wide array of experiences that disability can indicate. So the words in italics all the way on the right are examples of some different types of disabilities you may encounter. Um, and then kind of moving back towards the left, we have disability is the overarching umbrella and then split between physical and brain-based. So starting with physical disability, this could be something that is easy to identify, such as someone who uses a wheelchair, or something that may be a little harder, like heart disease, where you may not know the person has it unless they choose to disclose it to you. Uh, also paralysis, some kind of orthopedic impairment, being blind or low vision or deaf or hard of hearing are all examples of physical disabilities that do not necessarily come with any kind of cognitive component. Um, you can see someone with, you know, 
PhD who has a physical disability and the, uh, their thinking patterns are in no way different from someone without a disability. Then we shift down to brain-based disabilities, and there's a really important split here, particularly in the criminal justice system, between mental illness and developmental disabilities. Um, in some of the trainings and outreach that the ARC has been doing, we're seeing um, a real misunderstanding about this divide. So mental illness is something that affects thinking, feeling, and mood, but not necessarily IQ. And developmental disabilities can affect IQ, but don't always. So this is a really important thing to remember, particularly as you're considering appropriate accommodations in a courtroom setting. So the ARC's experience is particularly with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And you can see in yellow and orange there, intellectual disability indicates a lower IQ and um, impairments in adaptive functioning skills. So that's basically how you interact with the world. And there are various tests there. It's important to recognize that it's not just IQ that makes up intellectual disability. Um, it's also that adaptive functioning as well. Uh, included under the developmental disability umbrella are autism spectrum disorders and fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. These three things are um, disabilities that we've seen more commonly in the criminal justice system. Uh, also out there in gray, you can see traumatic brain injury and cerebral palsy as examples of developmental disabilities. Um, cerebral palsy in particular may not come with an IQ component, or it may. So somebody who has cerebral palsy may have all of the external signs. They may need a wheelchair to help get around sometimes, um, or use a walker, or have um, impaired speech, but have nothing cognitively um, impacting them, or they may. Uh, so it's a little bit of a tricky one, and that's just kind of a good example of, again, that, uh, that idiom, if you know one person with a disability, you know one person with a disability. Uh, traumatic brain injury is also a tricky one because the practical effects can look a lot mm -hmm. like intellectual disability in certain instances, but for the criminal justice system and for a lot of statutes, there's an age of onset requirement for the protections that come with intellectual disability. So that's just another sticky point when we're, when we're talking about disability. So that was a lot of information in one very small flowchart. Um, so we're going to talk now a little bit more about the impact on crimes. So people that are victims of crimes and also have, again, we're sticking to this intellectual and developmental disability, um, are victims of crime at a much higher rate than even people with other kinds of disabilities and certainly at a higher rate than the population of people without disabilities. Um, the ability or decision to report can be very much impacted. Um, often people with IDD, that's short for intellectual and developmental disabilities, live in settings where they are very dependent on caregivers and other support staff. And this makes the decision to report all that much harder, um, particularly if it is the caregiver or support staff that is victimizing them. Professionals' receipt of the report can, again, weigh in on that decision to report to begin with. If the person is aware that they communicate in a way that may be difficult to understand, this can impact their decision to report. They could say, you know, I know the professional's not going to believe me. Um, this isn't going to go over well, and that can, again, discourage reporting. Uh, medical treatment, again, a lot of those communication barriers can be tough, and who is taking them to medical treatment? It's going to be a caregiver or a support staff in a lot of positions. Uh, and it, access to advocates, again, that issue, it's just this one big circle of dependency that makes reporting all that much harder. So our case that we're going to focus on today um, in order for us to have a better understanding of prosecuting cases involving victims with developmental disabilities and mental health issues um, is the state versus Richard Claudio. And this is not an actual case, um, but certainly if you started to research the available case law across the United States, and I would venture to say other jurisdictions around the world, you would find, unfortunately, um, some similar themes and some similar facts. So Valerie Smith is a 16-year-old girl with an intellectual disability IQ of 65, cerebral palsy, and difficulty speaking. She lives with her grandmother, and she attends a city charter school every weekday. 
a customized community transportation bus picks her up at home and takes her to school and transports her from school to home every single day. So that's our background. In the early afternoon on a Tuesday, Valerie reports to her school-based speech therapist, Sheree Muhammad, that Valerie wants to tell her something. Valerie says, Richie was messing with me. Sheree asks who Richie was, and Valerie says the afternoon bus driver. In response to Sheree's question, Valerie states that Richie rubbed her privates on top of her jeans and also unzipped her jeans and, quote, stuck his fingers in me, and quote, and, quote, it hurt, end quote. She also says Richie was rubbing on her boobies. Valerie says no one else was on the bus at the time that this happened. Cherie immediately reports the incident to the principal, and the school immediately calls 911 and reports the incident. And I know that Catherine brought this up earlier, but we want to note here again, there there's a three-pronged test for determining whether a person has an intellectual disability. So if we're looking at the guidance from the American Association on Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities, we're going to look at an IQ of 70 or below, characterized by significant limitations both in intellectual functioning and in adaptive behavior, and an onset that occurs before age 18. Catherine? Yeah, sorry. Um, so when we're communicating with a, a victim, it's really important to understand that often um, people with disabilities are not going to communicate the same way that you or I would, um, and that they're going to use a number of different kinds of devices or techniques that they have used throughout their lives in ideal circumstances or maybe are just learning to communicate about the crime um, in less than ideal circumstances. So it's an, important to just kind of be familiar with these and be open to using them. So some of the communication aids that are typical, um, iPads are very popular and there's all sorts of speech production software, um, picture communicators, talk talk devices, and then also the use of interpreters can be crucial, uh, particularly for people who are deaf or hard of hearing. Um, and then actually, in some of our previous work with Bev France, we've heard her tell stories about the revoicers, which is um, basically using an interpreter for somebody who has a cognitive disability as well. Um, working with professionals who work with the victim is kind of a double-edged sword, so you want to make sure that um, you're not getting the professional story instead of your victim's story when you are working with them. But that being said, they can be an invaluable source of information for communication techniques, um, potential triggers, and emotional problems, and other kinds of calming techniques as well. So just kind of keeping an eye on are they weighing in maybe more than they should? Are they in any way, shape, or form related to the incident? Um, and just kind of keeping an eye on that as well. Working with family members who can communicate with the victim is kind of the same situation. Again, can be a very useful source of information, but in the same time can uh, be problematic if they're not allowing the victim to speak. So this is just a picture of some different types of communication devices. So if they ever come across your desk, you will have seen them before. And you can see um, some examples here of picture communication. And I'm actually going to go ahead and go to the next slide here. So this is just a quick example of if you were doing an interview uh, with someone who had a communication difficulty um, and, you know, they may be very stressed out and they may not be able to verbally communicate um, and respond quickly and tell you that they need a break. So having something like this where they can say, I'm done, I don't understand, I need help, or I want a break, and they can either point to the picture or they can make the gesture that's in the picture. And this is just a nice little cheat sheet to have on the side um, for an option outside of verbal communication. Uh, another particularly effective communication technique for people with intellectual disabilities in particular is to use a calendar. Um, as we all know, the criminal justice system can take uh, quite a while to resolve a single case. 
And people with intellectual disabilities in particular are very concrete thinkers. And this is the same for fetal alcohol spectrum disorder as well, and also helpful for people with autism. Um, so creating a calendar that has events that are meaningful to the person, and I'm talking a hard copy calendar that they can fold up and take home with them when you're done discussing it, that has, you know, for instance, maybe their birthday or important federal holidays that they'll be familiar with in addition to hearing dates and trial dates and that kind of thing can help them really get a concrete picture of, all right, so I told someone, I've reported and I've done what I'm supposed to do, but now this entire process is going to take a while. Because uh, that can be a tough thing to get your head around. We tend to mostly talk about the part where you report and talk less about the months that can follow as you're going to trial. That's so true, Catherine. And thinking back to this board, you know, much of our emphasis gets placed on how this board can help us who are part of the system already communicate with survivors. But this can also be a board that under circumstances that are worked out in advance of trial, um, you might be able to provide to the victim so that he or she can use this board during testimony. Um, and there can be some kind of system work out where maybe even um, the victim is showing the sign just to the prosecutor or even turning and showing it um, to the judge. So these are things that should be considered throughout what can unfortunately be sometimes a long process. So let's go back to our case. The school immediately calls 911 and the operator tells them an ambulance is going to be sent. And Valerie is taken to the hospital in the ambulance where she is then examined by a sexual assault nurse examiner. And a sexual assault nurse examiner is a nurse who's specially trained to evaluate and examine um, pediatric and adolescent victims of sexual assault in the immediate aftermath of the crime. So that would be the sexual assault nurse examiner that we have on this slide, a SANE P. A SANE A would be a sexual assault nurse examiner who treats adult patients. And in addition to conducting the exam, the SANE also collects evidence from the patient. The SANE documents information and makes referrals for other treatment and other services. So a sexual assault nurse examiner uses a lot of specialized tech, uh, examination tools like uh, a colposcope um, and may also take photographs during an examination so that she can document findings and bruising. While at the hospital, Valerie tells the sexual assault nurse examiner that Richie put his fingers in her vagina and then wiped his fingers on her shirt. She also tells the sexual assault nurse examiner that Richie was squeezing her breast. And this is important information to know because then the sexual assault nurse examiner understands where to swab for certain kinds of evidence. So she's going to make sure, based on what Valerie has disclosed, um, that the shirt is recovered. And that when she says he was squeezing her breasts, that she's going to swab those breasts. Later we find out um, the medical examination reveals no vaginal injury, no bruising around the vagina, and no bruising on the breast. So Valerie was looking for touch DNA or um, vaginal fluid, and she also collected two pubic hairs from Valerie's breast. The shirt, the jeans, and the bra were collected and sent to the lab for testing. And as far as touch DNA, what we should note is that investigators and prosecutors would most likely have to specially request the touch DNA from the gene. So some jurisdictions would actually wait to test that until after the results from the sexual assault forensic examination kit are received. And before we move on to the next slide, I want to just stress that um, there, in this case, you know, there's no vaginal injury, no bruising around the vagina, and this is certainly common in the majority of sexual assault cases that involve certainly penile penetration. So we're talking beyond digital. There's absolutely no vaginal injury at all. So 
And then just taking it kind of back to the victims more generally, as you're doing this investigation, we just described the, the medical process. And it's important to watch out for re-traumatization here and to use a trauma-informed response. So this is something that is person-centered, meaning that you're focusing on the victim's needs, culturally sensitive, and highly individualized response, particularly if there are unique communication needs. And again, the number one goal is to avoid re-traumatization and understand the profound effects that trauma likely had on this person. And beyond the person, recognizing the impact on family members and caregivers as well, particularly if the person needs a lot of support in daily life, the family members and caregivers can be just as impacted by any type of reinvestigation. So if at all possible, you want to get as much information as possible in one fell swoop and not have to go back in and talk about things over and over again, if at all possible. And certainly getting information about um, other traumas that a survivor might have experienced over the course of her life could um, be relevant in explaining perhaps reporting times, um, mechanisms of reporting, um, minimization of an offender's culpability, some kind of demeanors that a survivor is expressing. So all of those things, particularly a consideration of historical different trauma, are important in that trauma-informed response. So at some point after Valerie, our survivor, our victim in our case, is examined at the hospital and physical evidence is collected, an appointment is then made for Valerie to be forensically interviewed. And forensic interviews are typically done for children ages 2 to 18. And they're considered the cornerstone. They really are the cornerstone of an investigation. Um, they can be very effective in terms of protecting our children. Um, they can be very effective down the road for prosecution. And they may be the thing that serves as the beginning point on the road toward healing for many survivors and their families. And the purpose of this kind of interview is to obtain a statement from the victim, from the child, in a developmentally and culturally sensitive, unbiased, fact-finding manner that supports accurate and fair decision-making by the various members of a multidisciplinary team um, who are working on a case. So we're usually talking about law enforcement, advocates, prosecutors, perhaps medical professionals, if new information regarding necessary treatment is learned during the interview. Um, the, these interviews can be really, really important parts of the case. And, and just to get into some of the specifics, you know, often the entire interview will be watched through um, either a double-sided mirror or perhaps closed-circuit television by a police officer from hopefully a specialized special victims unit, um, perhaps by a caseworker from Youth and Family Services. And um, often these interviews, in most cases, they're taped for later viewing by um, a prosecutor from the local DA's office or um, other prosecutor's office if there is a circumstance where a case is going federally. So there's certainly also special provisions for uh, victims who have developmental disabilities. So there are language interpreters, there are um, deaf interpreters. In deaf cases, a forensic interview center will use a deaf team. They'll use a certified deaf interpreter and a hearing interpreter. They have uh, training for the professionals on working with victims with autism. They have rooms that are appropriate, for example, rooms with lower lights, less noise in the waiting room, or waiting in a different or a quiet room. Um, and after the forensic interview occurs, a team, the team that's working on the case, is going to meet and discuss the appropriate next steps in the case. So during Valerie's forensic interview, she says that Richie digitally penetrated her, put his fingers in her vagina and touched her breast, and she didn't say anything to Richie because she was scared he wasn't going to take her home. Remember, he's the bus driver. She also says that Richie told her not to tell anyone and that he was going to bring her some candy. And he even asked what her favorite was, and she replied with something very specific. She said, Mike and I. So law enforcement are going to, at this point, look to a variety of sources for possible evidence. They can interview Ms. Muhammad. They can interview Valerie's grandmother, interview school employees. Um, the bus supervisor regarding the defendant's normal bus route, 
And as far as interviews of other students, they would have to consider also which students would have been on that bus and what needs they may have during the interview and ev evidence gathering process. Forensic interviews might be considered for some of those students. And um, although not likely in this case, in other cases, a pretext phone call might be appropriate for um, to be arranged between the victim and the suspect, so um, or somebody who is pretending to be the victim. But again, that is not something that would be likely to occur at all in this case. The other thing that law enforcement might want to look for is changes in Richard Claudio's behavior. So how did he react, for example, when Valerie wasn't on the bus the day that she reported this incident? Did he ask anyone where she was? Did he make any comments about her? And of course, always, always, law enforcement should attempt an interview with a suspect. So under the facts of our case, the defendant would be charged with statutes that cover digital penetration and unlawful contact or indecent assault, plus perhaps other statutes like endangering the welfare of children, corruption of minors. Um, in our case, remember, Valerie was scared that the defendant wouldn't take her home if she said anything, and perhaps he made a direct threat to her. And if so, if we uncover this during an investigation, additional charges like terroristic threats might be appropriate. As the prosecutor prepares for trial against Richard Claudio, I, as we've already discussed, there are going to be a number of things to consider. And um, one of those things could be criminalistics and DNA. So let's assume that prior to trial in this case, law enforcement and the prosecutors receive a lab report that indicates the following. Valerie's vaginal fluid was found on her breast. So what does that do? That corroborates what she said, which she did. Two pubic hairs belonging to Valerie were recovered from her breast. Again, as a prosecutor, you would argue that's corroborative evidence. And that the defendant's touch DNA was recovered from her genes. Again, corroborating what she said. So we have a question that we'd love to pose to our participants today, and that is what pretrial motions would you file as a prosecutor of State v. Richard Claudio? And you can private chat those responses to me, and I'll share them with our presenters and with the, with the participants as they come in. So do you guys just want to chat some different motions that you would consider filing? So some of the pretrial motions that uh, we as disability advocates would like for you to consider um, are, of course, keeping an advocate in the room or even next to the victim. Again, this kind of goes back to that whole re-traumatization discussion, and the more secure that the person can feel in an unfamiliar setting, the better. Um, so that could be a confidential victim advocate, a support person from a disability organization, um, the victim's personal assistant, somebody familiar to them. We have also seen cropping up around the country uh, support dogs who can very unobtrusively sit, um, you know, under the person's chair or nearby, and it just kind of allows the victim to reach down and pet the dog if they're feeling um, stressed out, and it can be very calming. They've seen pretty good results with those programs, but I think those are still kind of a jurisdiction by jurisdiction thing. Um, and finally, of course, rape shield laws. You do not want your victim's name published and um, may need to file a pretrial motion to ensure that that doesn't happen. And Catherine, I just want to jump in and share some of those participant responses that have been coming in um, as you were discussing some motions for special courtroom accommodations, but also um, for motions for admitting forensic interview recordings um, and hearsay exceptions to admit those interview, rec uh, interview recordings or maybe transcripts, and then also protective orders to allow for breaks and the support person as you were talking about. So coming back to our case, the defense files the following motions. One, challenging the victim's competence. Two, 
um, alleging taint, and three, seeking the victim's mental health records. So let's break down the three of those um, and talk about them in, in a few, the next few slides. Um, generally, a witness is presumed competent to testify, and this slide uses um, Wyoming's competence rule as an example, and that state's evidence rule um, is that a person is generally competent to testify if he can understand, receive, remember, and narrate impressions and is sensible to the obligations of the oath taken before testifying. Further, a witness's intelligence, not his or her age, should guide a court in determining whether the witness is competent to testify. And interestingly, most states go um, a little further, obviously, in, in their case law. And Wyoming has adopted a five-part test to assist in determining a child's competency to testify. Those five parts are um, an understanding of the obligation to speak the truth on the witness stand, the mental capacity at the time of the occurrence concerning which he is to testify to receive an accurate impression of it, a memory sufficient to retain an independent recollection of the occurrence, the capacity to express in words memory of the occurrence, and the capacity to understand simple questions about it. And, you know, for prosecutors, you need to be intimately familiar um, with not only the rule in your jurisdiction, but going through the case law and um, determining what the test is for competence. Um, to what extent competence can be challenged, to what extent, um, to when it can be challenged, and then what you would need to introduce or the kinds of questions um, that you would want to ask a child or an adult witness in order to demonstrate competence. So the core belief underlying the theory of taint is that a child's memory is particularly susceptible to suggestibility so that when called to testify, a child may have difficulty distinguishing facts from fantasy. Taint is the implantation of false memories or the distortion of real memories caused by interview techniques of law enforcement, social service personnel, and other interested adults that are so unduly suggestive and coercive as to infect the memory of the child, rendering that child incompetent to testify. So because state implicates the ability of the child to distinguish real memories of an event from falsely implanted suggestions, courts such as Pennsylvania's have found that taint could in fact, the mental capacity of the child witness to independently recall the event and truthfully testify. So because the capacity to remember and the ability to testify truthfully about that memory are components of competency, Tate then gets explored in a competency hearing. And at a hearing like that, at a competency hearing, it's the burden of the party raising the question first to present some evidence of Tate before that question can even be considered. And then second, to overcome the presumption of witness competency by clear and convincing evidence. So that's, that's the example of um, law in Pennsylvania. And then remember our third um, defense challenge, and that is mental health records. So the general rule is that the psychotherapist patient privilege is absolute making the promise of confidentiality contingent upon the trial judge's later evaluation of the relevant, relative importance of the patient's interest in privacy and the evidentiary need for disclosure, it would eviscerate the effectiveness of the privilege, period. I mean, it would absolutely eviscerate the, the entire um, meaning behind that privilege. However, there are some exceptions. So due process, we have... Um, requiring the state to disclose any exculpatory material it possesses could apply to otherwise privileged information in a witness's mental health records. And under some circumstances, upon a defendant's sufficient showing of necessity, a trial court judge should conduct an in-camera review of the witness's mental health records to determine possible relevance. So the latter may occur, for example, if in seeking the victim's mental health records, the defense argues that the information contained therein may indicate that her mental health, you know, in some way impaired her capacity to observe the event when it occurred, um, to communicate 
what she saw accurately and truthfully during trial, um, or maintain a clear memory of the event in the meantime. And when we worked with Beth France, she raised um, a question, what if a person with an intellectual disability and or cerebral palsy has only a psychosocial eval in her medical record? You know, Beth stressed that generally people with such disabilities do not see a mental health therapist, and rather they have evaluations, behavior plans, um, IEPs, and that references to these things could be made, for example, in medical records created as a result of the sexual assault forensic examination. And something like that could very well happen in, in the case of Valerie. So the prosecutor can be proactive and try to ensure that only the medical records related to the sexual assault forensic examination are turned over. So we're going to read all records carefully before we turn over anything. Any irrelevant information turned over can be litigated out in pretrial motions. And there, um, there's an example of this in, in many cases. And if anybody is interested in getting additional information um, on this kind of, um, uh, on the necessity of protecting the mental health information and of cases that have upheld privilege, you can reach out to us and we'd be happy to send you the case law. So jumping in with some trial considerations and strategy, got a nice, uh, another visual here. So preparing the victim for what's going to happen in the courtroom is just as important as trying to explain to them how long the process is going to take. So these are just some considerations. Um, take the victim to visit the courtroom ahead of time, if at all possible. Maybe introduce them to the judge or at least show them what the judge will be wearing. Um, address room temperature, uh, glasses if they need them, a uh, blanket, teddy bear, other some, kind of, uh, some other kind of comfort item. Um, know the time of day and how long the person can usually dedicate to a task without needing a break ahead of time. Have food and water available, tissues. Um, and another strategy that's not listed here but that we've seen good luck with is social stories. So this is where you would develop a third-party story, um, maybe with some illustrations, uh, about somebody else that went to court. And we would talk about things like appropriate attire and how to respond to questions and just walking them through what's going to happen ahead of time with a story about someone else, um, you know, both emphasizing that, yes, this does happen to other people, and two, familiarizing them with the process ahead of time so that hopefully there aren't too many surprises on the day of the trial. So in cases involving sexual assault, the state may present evidence in its case in chief of a prompt complaint by the victim. Um, and that's because the victim's testimony is automatically vulnerable to attack by the defendant as um, a fabrication. Um, and sort of the, the history of this is that, you know, people assumed that there would be a hue and cry from a, a victim after he or she was sexually assaulted. And um, in rape cases, most state courts recognize that the credibility of the victim is always at issue. So the rationale behind that prompt complaint is that a, a rape victim would complain at the very first opportunity where she felt safe to do so. You know, this is inherently a, a subjective standard. Um, first of all, we who work on sexual assault cases know that um, often victims delay telling anybody um, about so uh, about the assault. So the admissibility of evidence is, of course, up to um, the trial court. It's, the, it's at the judge's discretion, and including, um, you know, giving a a jury instruction, and those things can be. Um, really just done on a case-by-case on -case basis. So courts around the country have recognized that minor victims who may not have appreciated the offensive nature of a sexual assault um, and uh, may not have um, told anybody for a long time, right? So some children do not view a sexual episode, uh, a sexual assault, as shocking or even 
under some um, unfortunate circumstances particularly unusual. Similarly, if a victim suffers from um, a developmental disability or diminished capacity, a prompt complaint instruction might not be appropriate. Um, so in our case, we know that Valerie disclosed promptly to Shereen Muhammad, her speech therapist. And it, you know, it would be interesting to look into why Ms. Muhammad, um, did Valerie have a close relationship with her and feel that she could really trust her? Um, so again, prompt complaint or lack thereof is admissible, but the details of the, the disclosure that the victim makes to that individual might not be admissible, and this all depends on the jurisdiction. So two that come to mind where details are not admissible are Maine and Oklahoma, but there are certainly many other jurisdictions where such details are admissible. This slide features a New Jersey case that ultimately concluded um, evidence of a non-prompt report would be admissible for consideration but wasn't dispositive of a claim of rape. And so we wanted to um, include it for that reason. Again, it can be helpful information, but the courts have um, said that it's not dispositive. Earlier we learned that the medical examination revealed no vaginal injuries, and we also mentioned that um, the majority of uh, sexual assault cases involve a lack of vaginal trauma. So at trial, we'll call a medical expert to talk about the fact that in the majority of such cases, there is no injury. And here, in our case, we have digital penetration. So the expert will talk about some of the reasons for lack of injury, incorporating that expert's experience as well as studies about lack of injury. And during the direct examination, the, victor, the um, prosecutor will have already sort of laid a, um, a foundation for medical testimony by asking Valerie about her experiences in the hospital. So depending on witness order, et cetera, if Valerie has already testified, the prosecutor will, if possible, ask her or ask a lay witness or someone else, you know, total time spent in the hospital, total time of the examination, um, how Valerie felt during the examination. And this is gonna help tie in the evidence that is going to be testified to by the medical expert. The medical expert could be the um, medical fact witness. It could be the sexual assault forensic exam examiner who performed the examination, or it could be someone else. It could be an additional expert. We wanted to include information about other physical evidence and DNA tested as part of this webinar in order to stress that ultimately, although so much of our focus in cases involving victims with developmental disabilities and mental health issues will be on that victim, and ensuring that she or he has support services and that we as prosecutors are doing whatever we can do to support their participation in the case and their testimony, we can't forget all of the other necessary components of trial preparation and admission of evidence at trial. And when it comes to physical evidence recovered and tested for DNA, prosecutors must introduce evidence showing chain of custody, that the items recovered were properly documented and handled by the persons charged with getting them from their original location to the testing site. We can no longer introduce lab analysis results without the in-court testimony of the laboratory tech or analyst who certified the report. And this was the holding in the Melendez DS case, which is included in this slide. Two years um, after the Melendez Diaz case was decided, the Supreme Court decided another case called Bull Cumming v. New Mexico. And the Supreme Court in that case held that the Confrontation Clause prohibits the pro prosecution from introducing a forensic lab report through the testimony of an analyst who did not sign the certification or personally perform or observe the testing. So again, you know, prosecutors, dot all your I's, cross all your T's. In our case, we learned that Valerie returns to school after the assault and has a new bus driver, Miss Pam. Valerie tells Miss Pam that she misses Richie. During the trial, when asked to identify the defendant, Valerie points to Richie. She smiles and waves to him. So these are behaviors that might seem puzzling to lay persons, to fact finders, to our jurors, and even to our judges. So how can we address this behavior at trial, 
this slide contains New Jersey's expert opinion testimony um, rule of evidence. And first, we'll address victim behavior through the testimony of the victim herself, as well as through the testimony of other lay witnesses. We'll lay a factual foundation that may explain some of these behaviors by having the victim or other persons explain the victim's reaction to trauma in general, specifically to the trauma she experienced as a result of Richie's assault, um, her behaviors in general. Um, and then in terms of the expert, you know, another rule of evidence 702, so this slide features 703, but there's another rule of evidence 702 that basically states that if um, scientific, technical, or other specialized knowledge beyond that possessed by a lay person will assist finders of fact in understanding the evidence presented at trial or in determining a fact and issue, an expert who is thus qualified by knowledge or skill or experience or education or training can testify. So we recommend that prosecutors work with experts during trial prep and when appropriate, call experts to testify at trial. Expert testimony on victim behavior is allowed to some extent in all 50 states. Prosecutors should identify the behaviors that seem confusing or seem counterintuitive or that may impact their ability to accurately jurors, we're talking about jurors' ability to accurately assess the victim's credibility, such as a delayed report, um, perhaps continued contact with the offender after an assault, minimization of offender's culpability, victim self-blame, um, and identify an expert in a field who can testify objectively about victim behavior. So this person will not meet the victim, will not interview the victim, but will testify objectively, objectively about victim behavior. Prosecutors should also um, include information about the victim's conditions and abilities in the trial. Both an expert and lay witness can testify about those abilities. So what if the defendant has a developmental disability? Remember that the prosecutor is responsible for seeking justice. So the competence as well as the relevant aggravators and mitigators should be considered at the outset and proactively assessed. So when we're talking about competence, a defendant is presumed competent to stand trial. And in order to prove that he is incompetent, he or she, the defendant, must establish that he's unable to understand the nature of the proceedings or unable to participate in his, in his own defense. When we're talking about um, admissibility of statements, a confession from a defendant is is under the law not made knowingly when the defendant is incapable of comprehending the meaning of Miranda warnings at the time he's interrogated. And when we're talking about um, defenses, states have a um, variety of ways of looking at uh, guilty but mentally ill versus legal insanity. Um, and we are certainly happy to provide more information on this. But I would point um, those attorneys who are listening who are focused on um, defenses um, to contact Jeff Skakowski, who works at the Disability Rights Network, and his um, name is at the bottom of the slide. We'd be happy to provide his contact information after the webinar. So I do want to jump in here a little bit because um, the National Center on Criminal Justice and Disability, we take information and referrals from around the country from both victims and suspects and offenders. So if a defendant is convicted of all the charges, there are several very important things that we would hope prosecutors would consider, um, including the nature and gravity of the crimes, the impact on the victim, defendant's reaction to the verdict, uh, whether it was acceptance or remorse, et cetera, defendant's criminal history, whether there were any priors involved, defendant's characteristics, education, familial support, community support, or employment history. Um, and I just really want to zero in here a little bit on um, sex offenders with intellectual disabilities. We have seen now uh, multiple cases from around the country in two primary areas where the prosecutors can play a really important role. And the first is high-functioning autism and child pornography charges. Um, we are seeing, again, around the country, uh, men with autism in particular who don't understand the difference between adult and child bodies when they're looking at pornography on the Internet. This will be someone with good community support, no prior criminal convictions, 
um, or really interactions with the law, and then all of a sudden here they are with federal charges, and they don't necessarily understand um, why until it's explained to them. Then there is huge remorse, and often with risk assessments completed, they're at no risk of touching a child, um, though they did look at the child pornography. So we have seen now more than one fact pattern like that. Um, and in the second area that we've seen a couple of are statutory offenses. Um, so people with intellectual and developmental disabilities can often stay in a high school setting up until age 22. Um, and then even outside of that, um, we've seen several instances of, say, middle schoolers bullying um, a 20, I think he was 24 at the time, 24-year-old man with intellectual disabilities. They would be getting off the bus. He would be coming home from work. Um, and there were repeated altercations, police reports, et cetera, where these kids were bullying him, and he did not have defense mechanisms in place. And this all culminated in an interaction where, um, according to the man, the children pushed him down and pulled his pants down, and according to the kids, he got mad and yelled at them and exposed himself. And now this man is on a sex offender registry for the rest of his life and can no longer live in the group home where he was living and uh, can no longer participate in a club that he liked to go to at the local high school. And basically his family is having to support him until they can find somewhere that will take him. And let me tell you, there are not many places interested in taking people on the sex offender registries to live in a group home or supported living situation. Um, so we've seen several really dramatic fact patterns like that, and it ends up with family members um, impacted just as much as the person with a disability who committed the sex offense, who broke the, who broke the law. And again, just to kind of put it in perspective, these people often live lives that are, where they're very dependent on other people and where privacy is very much limited. Um, so even if you were to live in a group home, a support staff could come into your room at any point, whether you were having personal time or not. And then if you have grown up in that kind of setting, all of a sudden a charge of public masturbation takes on a very different tone, um, where you may not have even understood that that was an inappropriate thing to do. So um, while, yes, there is technical law breaking going on, and there are victims in these situations, uh, it's important to really look at all of these sentencing considerations and maybe even consider whether or not to press charges. And just a real quick plug for the center, um, NCCJD, one of the services we offer are um, personalized justice plans where we work together with providers and family members and the individual themselves to put together a plan that hopefully the court and the prosecutor will feel comfortable signing off on that will outline supervision, prevention, and will involve risk assessment and all those kinds of things. So if you're ever in doubt, information and referral, give us a call and we'd be happy to help set something up. So at sentencing, um, the impact statement can provide a victim and her family uh, the ability to detail physical, psychological, economic effects that the crime has had on them, and importantly, victims who need assistance in preparing a victim impact statement can and should receive help from the prosecutor's office. So this slide contains information about victims' rights and impact statements in Mississippi, but most jurisdictions do have similar rights. Restitution is about restoring a victim to the extent possible to her pre-crime economic status um, through the provision of compensation and the fast return of property that is deemed no longer necessary to prosecute a case. So prosecutors should definitely work with victim witness assistance as well as advocates, caregivers, family members to ensure that necessary receipts and documentation are collected so that a full restitution request can be made at the time of sentencing, at the time of sentencing, so collect this information as soon as possible. So going forward, uh, these are just a couple of bullet points to keep uh, in the forefront of your mind. We'll file motions to address victim support, competence, admissibility of statements, and exclusion of irrelevant evidence, that's that medical records point. Collaborate with experts before and during trial. 
and support victim rights throughout all trial phases, including sentencing and beyond. And as far as experts are concerned, NCCJD is also working on a national expert witness database because we think it's very important to use experts that actually specialize in intellectual and developmental disability and not just mental health uh, generally. And we just want to provide a couple of additional resources for all of you in our participation today. Um, the Institute on Disabilities at Temple University's College of Education is a fantastic resource. Uh, both Vicki and Catherine have mentioned Bev France, who works at the Institute throughout today's presentation, and they're just a fantastic resource. Um, so you should definitely reach out to them if you have any questions. Um, you can reach out directly or through Equitas or NCC. Uh, JD. We also want to give you a little bit of information, remind you that um, NCC JD does training and technical assistance and they provide information about addressing victim and witness and suspect defender issues. Um, and there are national clearinghouse for information and training on people with disabilities in the criminal justice system with a focus on intellectual and developmental disabilities. And here's another resource that is available on <laughs> on their website and the Pathway to Justice model highlights the challenges faced by people with intellectual and developmental disabilities in the criminal justice system. More information, like I said, it's available on the website at this link. And you will receive a PDF of today's presentation with all of these resources as well. And then we also have Vicki's contact information as promised um, and Catherine's as well coming up next. And I just want to thank both of our presenters for all of the um, great information they provided today as well as as all of you in attendance for your participation and dedication to increasing victim safety and offender accountability in your communities and across the country. When you exit iLink, we encourage you to visit our website at www.equitasresource.org where you can register for future webinars and training events and review additional information about Equitas. You'll also be receiving a follow-up email with a link to a SurveyMonkey evaluation for today's presentation along with that copy of the PowerPoint presentation and Vicki and Catherine's school biographies and you will have to find additional information about CLE credits. Please do remember that Equitas is a 24-7 technical assistance provider. We're available to respond to questions, concerns, and training needs as they relate to the prosecution of violence against women. So on behalf of Equitas, thank you all so much for your participation in today's presentation. Thank you.